Welcome back, beautiful Tri-State area. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up next in our entertainment and pop culture segment brought to you by Beach A. Cucina and Metropolitan Lifestyles, we're featuring Hollywood actor Josh Molina, a co-star on NBC's The West Wing and ABC's Sports Night. Joshua also appeared in Aaron Sorkin's The American President, Malice, and the Broadway production of A Few Good Men. More recently, he played David Rawson in Sonda Rhimes' Scandal. His 400 episodes of television include Inventing Anna, American Horror Story, American Auto, Shameless, and The Larry Sanders Show. Joshua's film appearances include Bulworth, In the Line of Fire, and A Few Good Men. Recently, he finished a Broadway run in Tom Stoppard's Tony-winning play Leopoldstadt. Today, he joins me to chat career, the current industry strikes, and what he's currently working on next. Welcome to the show, Superstar. Thanks for having me. Boy, your intro makes it sound uh, better than it has been. (laughs) You made my career sound really good condensed like that. You are a very, very important person in the entertainment industry. What are you talking about? So, first of all, I saw Leopold Schatt. Congratulations on what an amazing run. Thank you. That was a dream job. Truly a dream job. Well, what a perfect, perfectly cast part for you. Now, I'm going to give some exposition here for those who didn't see it or actually want to um, log on online and find the digital version of it. But the play, which ran on Broadway until July, followed the extended Mers family for three generations from 1890 to the, to the 1950s, basically. And from glory to destruction, you played... Herman Merz, the patriarch of this Viennese Jewish family. And when we first meet Herman, he's an extravagantly wealthy textile factory owner, desperate to be accepted into high society. But he's also trying to shed his identity by converting to Christianity, which actually was common practice during this period. How did you prepare for this role, especially for this role? And why was this story so important to retell? Uh, Great questions. Well, I actually replaced an actor, David Krumholtz, who originated the role on Broadway. So I had less time to prepare than the original cast, which had a longer rehearsal period and uh, more of a lead up to doing the play. So I felt like I was sort of thrown onto a steam locomotive that was already running. I did have some time. I had time to prep um, the director, Patrick Marber, who won a Tony for his direction of the play. And he's just a brilliant fabulous guy, uh, gave me some good recommendations of uh, books to read, um, uh, research to do, the um, associate uh, director, Deanna Weiner, and others compiled an incredible, what they called the Bible of the play, which uh, was a tremendous amount of information about everything discussed in the play, because this is a very uh, dense, information-heavy play by Tom Stoppard. I mean, it's beautiful, but there's also, there's a lot of history, as you say, it covers almost... uh, six decades and uh and then really first and foremost i'm a text first guy so really diving deep into the brilliant play by tom stoppard and reading the play and preparing the role and showing up with my lines memorized because i had a condensed and uh, compressed rehearsal period um and then seeing the play uh i had a uh, an advantage that most actors don't have. If you're in the original cast of the play, you don't get to see the play. I got to sit there and I saw five performances of the play during my rehearsal period. And I was able to see the scope and the breadth of the piece and what it looked like and what it sounded like and all the movement. And watching the incredible original cast was a big part of my uh, preparation. That's amazing that you had that fortunate opportunity because to your point, most actors, they don't get that. Now, yeah. it's and you also asked, I didn't answer, but you yeah. asked why is it important that the play was done now? Yes. I, think that's, I think that is a beautiful question. And uh, I was about to say, everybody knows the history of the Holocaust. That's not even true. The fact is these days when they do polls, uh, our young people know less and less about what happened during those years. So purely on an informational uh, uh, place, it's important that people and young people particularly heard and learned a little bit of history with the play. But uh, more so, I think we are unbelievably or maybe believably uh, in a situation where some of the seeds of what happened in the Holocaust are still around. Anti-Semitism is rife. Uh, I think uh, last year, 50 percent of hate related uh, crimes were uh, anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish crimes. So it's a play where you it's easy to sit if you do know your history and sort of judge, and particularly my character, 
who feels that, hey, things are great. I've uh, converted to Catholicism. Um, I'm rich. I'm doing well. I'm upwardly mobile. I'm uh, towards the top of cultural Vienna in 1899. And things look pretty good for the Jews. Uh, and it's easy to sit there and go, well, I know where this is headed. But I think it's also incumbent on the audience who watches the play to think, well, maybe I'm feeling pretty good as a Jew or a, a member of another minority group in America today. But maybe someone's going to point at me 10, 20 years from now and say, oh, that person didn't see the seeds uh, of hate that are that are, have been planted. Yeah, that's very true. Very true. Now, what's the parallel that actually when I was doing research about your your childhood, that you grew up in New Rochelle outside New York City and your parents were founding members of the Young Israel of Scarsdale Synagogue and 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 conservative. And but they sent you to modern Orthodox Westchester Day School. And after high school at Horace Mann, very well-known college prep private school located right here in the Bronx, you studied theater at Yale. Congratulations. This is an amazing run. I'm going somewhere with this. Thank you. Although not explicit. You've done your research. Yeah, I have. Now, although not explicit um, throughout the play, Herman is fighting against the stereotypical trope of the weak Jew. He does this by leaning away, like you said, from his Jewish identity and converting. Why was he so misunderstood? Yeah, well... He was able, as a Jew in, uh, you know, in turn of the century Vienna, to rise to a certain place of power. He's rich. He owns a textile factory at the beginning and then a business. Uh, and he is under the illusion that having converted to Catholicism, that he has remade himself. There are elements, uh, there are scenes in the play where it's quite clear that whatever his self-identity is, and I would say he is leaning away from his Jewish identity, clearly he's converted, really? but he's also really struggling with it. And you see that in the play too. Uh, but it's made clear to him by certain non-Jewish elements of society that whatever he may consider himself, he will be in their eyes a Jew. And there's only so far he can rise and he may be rising in cultural Vienna, but uh, as far as political power, that's never going to happen. And uh, so I think part of the story, at least my character story, and there are, I think there are 38 actors in the piece, so it's a big ensemble show. But part of my story is Hermann's realization that it's not just a question of how you see yourself or how you would present yourself. Um, certain people and certain elements of society are going to put you in your place and uh, uh, try to keep control of you, regardless of, of how you think you've remade yourself. Yeah, so many interesting parallels with where, with where we are as a society today. With, this is true. Know, interesting. Now, let's shift away from Leopoldstadt and let's talk current strikes. The strikes involving Hollywood actors and writers entail many distinct issues, but one of the most controversial concerns is the rights to artificial intelligence likeness by individual human beings. And the studios are requesting the right to offer contracts that allow them to scan our bodies, our voices, and other features of actors, including extras, and then hold the rights to the AI likeness in perpetuity. The actors are upset for good reason. What do you say to all of this? Yeah, I say uh, there are many issues uh, that have brought on this strike. Uh, one of the foremost ones is AI. Uh, the people who have created AI are saying, hey, we got to slow down. We're not sure exactly the power of this uh, this uh, um, the ability of AI and where that's going to go. That's true here too. I mean, for us, it's an existential threat where as actors, dancers, singers, stunt performers, we're worrying that we're going to be replaced by AI. There are already things where background actors, uh, their work is threatened by, the, there's something called tiling, which is an effect where they can take your image and instead of, if they have a, if they need a crowd scene of 500 people, they can do it with 20 people. So we yeah. can see a future with AI and the AMPTP is offering us nothing, any, no kinds of um, guarantees that this isn't going to happen where you can scan an actor, one person, man or a woman, uh, and then use his or her uh, likeness, as you say, in perpetuity. So maybe you get a hundred bucks for the day and then you never work again. I mean, we, this is a, an existential threat where actors are worried we're going to be replaced by zeros and ones. And yeah. uh, strangely, or maybe not strangely, um, the people we're supposedly bargaining with uh, have nothing to say in this year. They don't want to make any guarantees because they see an upside to uh, scanning you once and using you forever. Or, you know, and it doesn't just affect background actors. Maybe you play a small role in a Marvel movie and next thing you know, you're in 20 other Marvel movies that you haven't consented to or gotten uh, 
uh, compensated for. It's terrible. I mean, listen, I, I suggest that the eventual strike settlement forbids studios from buying the rights to AI likeness for more than than a single film or project or or as a compromise, the contract could be for some limited number of projects, but not in perpetuity. Right. Actors, right. actors thus would remain in long term control of their AI likeness. Yet if they wanted to keep selling those likenesses project by project, they could do so. And interestingly, um, Nielsen Media already releases how many billions of minutes each streamer gets in views, as well as the top 20 shows by billions of minutes watched. And the streamers get paid from subscribers, regardless of how many people watch per month or year. It's a subscriber model, not an ad-based model. And the reason they're not being transparent right now is because they don't want to disclose how profitable many of these shows have been thereby owing the creators their fair share. So this is going to go on for a while. Now, we have four minutes left. How do you balance Hollywood and family? You have a very fast-paced career. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I've been very lucky. I have worked a lot in and primarily in TV over the last 30 years. And uh, I've just been very fortunate, first of all, to get the work. Uh, second of all, to have work that has been primarily in Los Angeles near my home. And so I've been able to be uh, a, a dad who's around. I'm and now present. starting. Yeah, and that was always very important to me, but I, I'm sure there could have been situations where I was offered a job out of town that I would have had to take. And I have occasionally worked out of town, but it's been two days here, three days there. I haven't been away for weeks and weeks, and I know friends who have families who have been away for months, and it's, it is a difficult profession in that sense. So I've just been lucky. Uh, I've also made decisions. Uh, I haven't done theater, even though it's my first love from decades now because it meant um, if it was in town, then it meant that daddy was working whenever the kids were going to bed uh, because, you know, the show's at 8 p.m. every night. Um, and if and a lot of theater uh, takes the actor out of town. So I avoided that for a long time. My kids are now adults. My daughter yeah. is 25. My son is 21. Oh, God and, bless you. You uh, look they so young. Oh, you're very kind. They don't uh, they don't need daddy at bedtime anymore. <laughs> They yeah. don't want me. They don't want you there. Uh, so, so now I feel I can go a little bit further afield. I was able to go to New York for five months and do this play that was a dream of mine. Um, but I just uh, prioritized my family uh, when the kids were younger. It, it's clear and it shows. Now, you've acted in so many scenes. We have about two and a half minutes left. I want to get sure. through two more questions if we can. Some some intense scenes. What's the str What's the strangest thing you've caught yourself thinking about while trying to portray a serious character? Ah, that's very funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My mind strays a lot. Well, the hard part I have found uh, is theater. <laughs> in theater, I don't like to know who's in the audience because occasionally I find myself thinking about who's in the audience. Ah. So my very first, uh, I almost said episode because I'm a TV actor, my very <laughs> first performance of Leopoldstadt, uh, Tom Stoppard, the playwright himself was there, which uh, oh, I oh. wish I hadn't known because I spent a lot of time on stage thinking, oh, here I am. I'm doing Tom Stoppard's play in front of Tom Stoppard. Wait a minute. I'm thinking about Tom Stoppard as I do his play in front of him. That must mean I'm not concentrating on my I'm acting. I'm not concentrating on my acting. <laughs> right. This is not good. Oh, um, okay. So, so yeah. Tom Stoppard is the strangest thing you've acted about. <laughs> you've thought about while acting. <laughs> yeah, great. thinking about the playwright as I'm performing his work and maybe not uh, focusing the way I shouldn't. He should be so flattered. Okay, now oh. imagine you woke up in a world where everyone's emotions were represented by emojis. <laughs> what yeah. would your most commonly used emoji be and why? Oh, I'm sad, but I, I am definitely the shrug emoji. <laughs> The shrug emoji. This is just, this is my reaction to almost everything as I get older. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> What's so going to be? I don't know. Is AI going to destroy the world? Forget about actors, uh, the world altogether. Uh, shrug emoji. Shrug emoji. Okay. And lastly, what are you currently working on? Ah, I am a co-host with Stephanie Butnick and Leah Leibovitz of a wonderful podcast called Unorthodox. It is the most popular Jewish-themed podcast in the universe. Uh, I'm having a great time doing it, and I'm allowed to do it during the strike, so it's nice to have a creative and intellectual outlet when I'm not working on other things. I love it. Well, we are out of time, my dear friend. You were so fun to chat with. I would love to have you come back. You are just a hoot to talk to. Ha, thanks so much. Great. Guys, you definitely have to check out Josh. Go directly to his Twitter at Josh Molina or his Instagram. A little bit complicated, but you'll definitely find him. Josh Molina's Josh Molina. And you can head directly to the Unorthodox podcast. Again, on the gram, you could find them. That was our entertainment and pop culture segment brought to you by BJ Cucina and Metropolitan Lifestyles. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this.